Welcome college basketball fans to the Full Court Press Podcast with LT and Sammy D. This is the podcast that brings you legendary stories from college basketball's golden era and dives in deep with the current analysis of today's game. Get ready for the most energetic and entertaining college basketball podcast around. Let's get it. Hello and welcome to another Full Core Press podcast, a college basketball experience. We got another hot one, got another conference preview show. Sam is with me in the flesh. And when Sam's with me, I just feel wonderful. So Sam, what's day. going it's on? A better day. It's good, yeah, man. It's- I'm, ex- I'm excited about this conference preview show. I mean, this is a, this is a league that uh, kind of stays under the radar the first part of the season. There's kind of those wow moments throughout the year you know that get national attention and um but i know me and you follow this conference pretty closely and it's going to be a tough one this year and they always have the highest team gpa as a conference (laughs) you You want to know why especially in this day and age because guys stay four years that's (laughs) yeah most of them most of them that's for sure hey coach we got yale head coach been there for a long Ask time, James Do- Jones. Welcome to the Full Court Press Podcast. Hey, Luke, Sam, thank you very much for having me on. Yeah, yeah, it's uh, it's pretty amazing and it's pretty remarkable. Uh, doing the research, and you know, we follow, we love all college basketball. Uh, we believe that there's good basketball everywhere in this country and uh, in college gyms everywhere. But I'm going to tell you something: the Ivy League was good last year. It's going to even be better this year, I think. Well, I tell you, you know. I, I like what we do in our conference. And to be honest with you, it's hard for me to think about anybody but my own team right now selfishly. I think that we're going to have an opportunity to be pretty good. I, I like my group and uh, a lot of work to do, but I, I like yeah. who we are. And uh, I'm not certain if we'll be good enough to beat the uh, Auburn team in the NCAA tournament, but I'd like to get an opportunity to try again. Yeah, yeah, no, yeah. that was an exciting uh, finish to last season for you. I mean, you guys are riding a wave of the most successful era of Yale basketball, in my opinion. And I mean, you won the championship in the league last year, and then you go to the tournament, you beat Auburn. Um, You know, what, what's been that process the last couple months as you get to know this team? Well, uh, it's just, uh, just going through the process of, you know, we got a lot of questions that need to be answered. We graduated three, we graduated two starters and we had one guy leave. Um, So there's some openings in the starting lineup right now. Some of it uh, was natural and, uh, the other spots I'm trying to figure out. I think I have, you know, one through four pretty good. I'm trying to figure out five through eight or nine. That's that's where we are right now. And that's what practice is for. And guys are coming to work every day trying to solidify themselves in one of those spots. And we're trying to figure out who works best together. Yeah. And I, and I look at your team, even though you lost a couple of players here and there. I mean, I really like Nick, uh, Nick Townsend and Casey Simmons. You know, they've got they got some opportunity last year, but I think this year this is going to give them an, a little bit more opportunity to kind of put pr- some pressure on them to shine. And I think they're going to do that for you. Well, that's one of the great things about our program is that um, guys get their opportunity and now it's their opportunity. Um, so uh, Nick Townsend is just it's just a flat out monster of a man. Um, you know, if you cut him open and found a metal skeleton below, I wouldn't be surprised. Like <laughs> he, He's like the Terminator, that guy. His brother was the same way. He's just a little bit more skilled than his brother was, but they're both tough as nails, both really smart. They cover up so much for guys defensively. And uh, my man, Casey Hughes, is like he's a springboard. He's long and athletic, really, really fast. And uh, he's really uh, made a a bigger commitment uh, to basketball this year. One one of the things about my team is that every single guy on my roster has been in the gym every single day since they got back, since they got to campus in August. Um, you know, and that's nothing that we've made them do. They're in, off, they're in the gym on their own, getting up shots with a teammate or on a gun or grabbing a coach when they can. So it's worked out real well for us so far. And I'm excited about the opportunity, especially for those two young men. Yeah. yeah. And then you got some experience on your team, you know, returning starters, John and Bez, who, you know, I mean, John regarded as probably the best. Hey, hey Sam, the- Sam, yeah. say his last name. I was going to say, Pol- it, but I'm scared. <laughs> Polakitos. How'd I do? Pulikitas. Oh. Pulikitas. Yeah, I mean, probably probably the best shooter in the league. And then Bez, you know, defensive player of the year returning, you know. Um, you know, how are those guys feeling? And, you know, I mean, any extra pressure for them going into this season? 
Well, I, I think the only pressure they have on them is that they want to play at the next level. I think that they're, you know, obviously they want to win another championship. They want to go to the NCAA tournament. That would make four for them uh, in four years, four championships in four years and three tournament appearances. So they want to do that. But uh, they want to get to the next level. They, they, you know, everybody grows up wanting to be something and, and uh, they want to be professional basketball players. Now, John, yeah. I don't know if he's the best shooter, but he is definitely the best tough shot maker. Huh. That, that we've had in our program since Azar Swain. And Azar made some really tough shots yeah. that kid. And Bez yeah. Mbang is flat out the best defensive on-ball player that I've ever coached and that pretty much that I believe that's ever been in this league. And when he's on the ball, it just makes your life a really – it's really tough. And I feel sorry for the younger guys we have in practice that they have to try to get around him on a daily basis because he's so big and strong. And his ability to um, anticipate your next move is, is second to none. But don't you think once they get in games, that's going to make him a better basketball player because they're so used to <laughs> dealing with him in practice? Well, that's the point. That That's why you're trying to get guys to work hard every day and give your teammate your best so um, they can improve and get better. So, yeah, I certainly think that that's going to make guys better, and I'm looking forward to it. And, you know, like, you know, when you get in a game now and somebody other than Bez and Bang is holding you, it's going to be like, oh, God, yes, it's a breather. <laughs> Yeah. So, so Be- Bez is not on me. This is fun. Yeah, that was like when I played ho- high school basketball. Uh, the coaches would always be- remember the broom. You'd bring a broom in the 90s, and it's like uh, you'd never make a yeah. shot. But then you go in the game, it's like you're making all these shots. Sometimes they're a little bit off kilter because you thought you're- the broom was going <laughs> to block you. But, you know, maybe uh, Bez is your human broom in uh, practice. But mm-hmm. uh, So what was a bigger – what do you think has had a bigger impact? You guys up sitting fifth seed at Baylor, or you guys last year up se- upsetting four seed at Auburn? Well, I think that Auburn victory, um, because you know they were a four seed, but they might have been fourth in the country. Mm-hmm. I mean, they, they were they were that good. They were. I mean, you know, when I was reviewing tape of them and trying to figure out an avenue for us to be successful in the game and trying to put a game plan together with my assistant coaches. Um, you know, it was really difficult to see a path for us. Um, I felt like, you know, we played Kansas and uh, Gonzaga early in the year, and um, we had great games against both of those teams. Um, we were leading both of them uh, through most of the first half. We actually led Kansas in the first half to halftime, and uh, the last 10 minutes, 10 minutes of the game got away from us. And I knew at that point if we had an opportunity to play one of these teams, we'd have a really good showing. So I didn't know that we would um, could would be able to beat – Auburn, but I knew that we would be close. And thankfully for us, some things went our way in the uh, last the end of the game, and we made some big shots. And and John got in his bag and, and went off a little bit, which obviously helped uh, make a difference for us. But that uh, game that went against Auburn was really special, and it's something that really um, has it got us going forward and given us the opportunity to be more positive and have more confidence. Yeah. I know you said you're, you're- – focused on your team right now, getting to know this group of guys and how they're going to fit on the court for you guys. Um, <clears throat> but when you look at the Ivy League as a whole, right, I mean, you know the coach as well. And that's when I look at the coaches in the Ivy League, I just see consistency from top to bottom. You know, I mean, I think everybody's been in that league for at least eight years, except uh, Coach Jock at Cornell, it's, but he's super familiar with the league, obviously, mm-hmm. right? So can you talk a little bit about kind of the the coaching brotherhood in the Ivy League and how that's matured over the last several years? Yeah, I don't know how much we like each other. I don't, I don't, <laughs> know, I don't know about that. I think that, um, you know, certainly there's a healthy respect for each team in the league. Um, and I look at us from top to bottom. Uh, I think a poll came out yesterday and had uh, Princeton as the uh, number one uh, uh, seed in the league. And, you know, you look at it, they got they have two guys coming back who are first-team all-league players, player of the year coming back. Um, they've done a really nice job, very difficult to play over the last few years, and we've had some success over against them, which has been really good. But they're going to have a really good team. They, You know, it's, for us, when you're a mid-major and you're good, it's really difficult to find games. So um, last year, I don't believe they had a high-major game on their schedule. Um, because they couldn't get anybody to play them. Actually, that's not true. They played Rutgers, um, and they had played Rutgers on a neutral court. Um, and then they had St. Joe's was their next highest level game that they had on their schedule, and they almost went undefeated in our conference. So they're going to be really good. You know, Brown, you know, they 
got so good at the end of last year. They got hot at the right time and I think they run six or seven in a row to end up making the Ivy League tournament. They they really did a great job against Princeton. They were up by 20 in that half in the first half against them and led the second half by most by about 20 as well. And they gave us everything they could handle and everything we could handle. And um, it was a miracle for us to actually beat them to go to the NCAA tournament, which was unbelievable for us. Uh, and Columbia has had a really nice group of guys. They've, got, they've gotten older and better. And uh, Jimmy Ingles does a great job actually and Owen. So you got to watch out for them. Now, you know, Cornell with, with Coach Jock, he's, he's there. It's the system that he's run. He loves the place. He plays, He went to school there. He was a captain of the team. He went to the Sweet 16. So he knows what he's doing. And their style of play is different than everybody else's in the league. And, you know, then you have Penn and Harvard, which have been perennial powerhouses in our league for a long time. And, and Dartmouth, uh, you know, just trying to continue to build and get better. So, yeah, from top to bottom, it's a really good, good league. And uh, it's going to be competitive. And, Every game you win is going to be really – every game you win is going to be tough, and it's going to be really important for you to do that to be able to win a championship. Yeah, so they had Princeton at one preseason, which, as you know, preseason means nothing once the games start. That's what I've been kind of posting on Twitter recently. It doesn't matter. I mean, it's funny. We've had some coaches that say – I mean, like some of these other conferences that have a lot of transfers, they're like, I don't even know who to pick. They're, I think they're just throwing darts. Who, who the coach they liked more than the other one was getting the picks. But, yeah, yeah. I mean, that's what it is. But, I mean, if you look at the body of work, you got Princeton, Yale, and Brown. Those are the three teams that are probably bringing back the most players and high-scoring players. I mean, Harvard got pretty hit hard with uh, Mack and uh, Okpara transferring. But what's amazing is you beat Auburn. You had a great year. And I look at your non-conference schedule, and I know it's tough because there's only eight teams in your conference, so you have to get a couple more games. Quinnipiac, you play UIC, one of my alma maters, so um, I hope you beat them badly. Uh, you play at Purdue, Emerson, you play at Minnesota, Stony Brook's a good program, Fairfield, Delaware, at Rhode Island, at Vermont, and Akron in uh, the Sun Bowl. And then, you you know, you play Howard. I mean, that's a good – Not many good, easy games there. <laughs> yeah, there, there, there aren't are too many cupcakes. And you know, I was once told if you ever get into a tournament and you don't know who the dog is, that means you're the dog. <laughs> but, oh, um, you know, we, we have a tough we have a tough schedule but I, I i like it that way it's going to help build character for us um you know we're playing against championship level teams and if you want to be a championship level team that's what you have to do so um, i'm looking forward to the challenges that we have and i know my te our team is as well yeah and i think people don't understand i mean the basketball college basketball purists do how good mid-major basketball has been the last couple of years and you know you always focus on the transfer portal and nil but what keeps happening is, and you know, the NI, the whole NIT, uh, you know, kind of whatever they did and the NCA and, you know, them talking about Spain, the mid majors just keep chugging along. And there's been some great teams and there's some great programs. And I'm, I'm going to tell you, there's going to be some more upsets this year. Well, again, that's what makes a uh, NCAA tournament special, right? If it wasn't for the little guy beating the big guy or having an opportunity to do that, it's just like, you know, my, it's, might as well just be a conference tournament. So um, this thing that we do at NCAA is like the, the the greatest thing in the world for me as a young man in basketball. I liken it to uh, being a five-year-old and still believing in Santa Claus and there's some guy in a red suit. Whoa, 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 whoa. Santa's, Santa's not real? real? <laughs> Santa's not real? Coach, I'm 48. He's yeah, I, 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 I apologize that your wife must be doing a great job <laughs> and you still believe in Santa. So, you know, but that's the feeling that you have, the innocence of the of your life, and that's the greatest moments of your life as a kid. At least it was for me growing up, and I know everybody has a different religion, but for me in Christmas, and that was like the most magical time of my life. And that's what it's like going to the NCAA tournament, and if you actually get a chance to win a game or two. It's nothing short of remarkable. So, do you like the idea of expansion? I do, in a sense that. Um, a lot of times mid-majors are cut out that are good enough. So, like, if you expand and just put more high-major teams in, then no. But if you expand it to teams that are, okay, well, uh, that that are really good. Like, Indiana State didn't make the NCAA tournament last year. Like, mm -hmm. you know, that, that's a crime. That's a crime. Like, there have been years in St. Mary's have won. They, they were, like, 26 and 4 and they don't get into the NCAA yep. tournament. Like, so yep. if you're going to expand it and include teams like that, yes, I'm all for it. But if you're just going to expand it for the sake of expanding, 
and having teams from the SEC and the Big East or, um, you know, well, there's no longer the Pac-10. Um, but if you're just going to expand it to put teams at the high major in the, the power four, yeah. um, that doesn't really make sense to me. Yeah, I mean, we saw so many upsets last year, and it's like the and it it does seem like the NCAA and the power conferences are trying to protect those power conferences with changes that are being made. I don't think that's a secret um, because it's a business, and that's where a lot of the money is in the business is those power conferences. But I'm seeing kind of the opposite effect happen, right? You're getting guys shifting so much in the portal, going one year here, one year one, year, and they may be superstars alone right? Statistically on the court and on highlight reels and stuff like that. But what, what I saw last year was programs that were keeping guys for two or three years and like building a culture on the court. And then they would bring a guy from a transfer portal who is a fifth year senior and brings that experience and wants to get more than six or seven minutes that he was getting at a power school and bump those minutes up to 20 plus minutes at a mid-major program. It's like they have a chip on their shoulder. Mm -hmm. do, do you kind of see that as, I, I guess the question I'm getting at is how much of what's happening in the NCAA is affecting the Ivy League? Well, it's, it's hard to say. Um, I, I think that the money that's involved is, is really crazy now. Um, it's hard to tell a kid, uh, the Mac kid that went to Georgetown, and you know, a power kid that went to, to Stanford. So not only do your parents not have to pay for you to go to school now, you're going to get two hundred to four hundred thousand dollars. Well, it's hard to tell a family who doesn't have much that no, you, well, you shouldn't take the four hundred thousand dollars because it's, your future is going to be worth more. Now, Stanford and Georgetown, those are pretty good academic schools. You know, it's not like that you've gone to some schools that, that are lesser, that, that much lesser academically. So it's, it's going to be hard that way. Um, the thing about it is, is that the recruiting has changed so much that these high major schools, they don't recruit high school kids as much anymore um, because they feel like if, if a kid can't come in and impact them as a freshman, they're pretty much going to leave as a sophomore. And why would I spend time, money, and energy on somebody that's going to leave so we'll just get a transfer who's less likely to leave again, right? And um, have an opportunity to build with with those kids, and they're going to be bigger, stronger, and and uh, and have a better opportunity for us to be successful. So the low major schools are able to get really good freshmen if you recruit right, and hopefully you can retain them to their juniors and seniors and have a chance to be really special. Yeah, yeah. Sam, do you think he's ready for uh, what's in store? Yeah, let's do it. So, Coach Jones, we do a little thing called the uh, the shot clock on the Full Court Press podcast uh, where LT is going to fire off five or six questions. Um, some of them may just be one-word answers. Some may lead to a little story, but uh, the platform's yours. Let's get it, LT. Okay. One word to describe the Ivy League. Consistent. Ooh. Biggest misconception. Slow play, backdoor, non-athletic. So Princeton. Yeah. I well, that's what, that's what everybody thinks of the Ivy League. Like they yeah. think that, you know, you're slow play, you're a backdoor team, um, you know, like we're the smartest kids in the world and we're going to outsmart you. You could be as smart as you want. If you can't put the ball in the basket, it doesn't work. Yeah. Yeah. If you can't Part fight and defend. Go ahead. I'm yeah. sorry. No, no, go ahead. No, if you can't fight if and you defend. Can't, if, you can't, if, you're, if you're not physically strong enough, you can't fight and defend and rebound, you can't win. So – you know, there's a lot of misnomers about who we are. Yeah, that's yeah. what I was going to say as well. Just the athleticism in the Ivy League is <clears throat> it's just as good as any uh, any mid-major conference. That's that's for sure. Well, you have a lot of Canadians. That's why. Uh, <laughs> let's be honest here. Luke, Luke, uh, just, Luke's from Canada, so he, he's going to harp on that. Yeah, well, I mean, there's one guy I can't even pronounce his name from, from Brown that's uh, <laughs> coming back from Burlington, uh, which yeah. Oakville's better. But anyway, uh, hard is Jim to play in in the Ivy League? Is John Lee Amphitheater? Good yeah. answer. I mean, it's that's top ten nationally, so good answer, Coach. Mm -hmm. uh, which coach would you say is the most animated on the sidelines? Oh, that's Jimmy Ingles. Jimmy Ingles, okay. Yeah. Which coach do you think had the highest GPA in college? Oh, that's a great question. Let's let's say let's give it to Dave McLaughlin. Okay. Okay. You just assumed he is. Okay. Um, which would you say bar from your two upsets in the last, you know, six years, eight years, what would you say is the most memorable Ivy league game 
or win in the NCAA tournament? Not yours. It's, it's got. It's got to be uh, Princeton beating Arizona. Okay, that's another yeah. great win for our conference, and you know they did. A, they did a great job, and it pains me to give anybody else any any props, but I got to give them their props. Yeah. Okay. Toughest recruiting battle for oh well, there's a kid that we recruited against Harvard. His name is uh, Ledlam, and uh, and I rec- I went to every single thing that kid did. Um, the summer before he went to print Harvard. Um, I did a couple of home visits with him. I saw a football game. Um, you know, my assistant coach, he has two, uh, two kids that were around his brother and sister's age. And, you know, they were together through all kinds of things. And it broke my heart that, uh, that the kid ended up going to Harvard. Yeah. Yeah. That's funny. That's funny. Who led or which team led the Ivy league in most, Team fouls called per game. Called, not not called. Called. That that had to be that had to be Columbia or Cornell. Cornell eighteen point two. Do you know who last was? Yeah. Uh, Princeton thirteen point five. You came in fourth with fifteen. So okay, um, it's okay. That's okay. So yeah. last question: If they made a Hollywood movie about the Ivy League coaches, what would they call that movie? About the Ivy League coaches. Yeah. Oh. Uh, hmm. And they would call it a ragtag group. <laughs> and, and 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 who would play you, Coach Jones? Well, <laughs> well, we before before he passed, I would think DMX would have been a good James Jones. There you go. There you go. <laughs> <laughs> that just made my day, Coach. Oh, you're welcome for that. You are the first coach to ever reference DMX, and we've had like 80 plus head coaches. So, you know, that's I could I could only imagine. So, what song would best describe you then? Well, I can't go there. Where this 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 this, this they let be women and children watching this. I can't go there. <laughs> we've had some wild ones thrown out there, from uh, definitely hip hop to uh, country music to the Grateful Dead. So it's yeah. uh, it's all over the board there, that's for sure. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So Sam, you want to finish him off? Yeah, Coach Jones, we appreciate you coming on the show for a little Ivy League preview and uh, giving us an update on your Yale Bulldogs. Um, Going to turn the last minute of the show over to you. Hey, if there's any out, Sam, who picked you, Yale last year? Say so again. That was, that was you. You did. You yeah, picked just, Yale. You know, Coach, you're on here. I wanted yeah. you to know something. He yeah. ragged on me, as did other people on social media, when I picked Yale last year to win the Ivy League. So, you know what? I don't live in the past. I don't dwell in the past, but I'm going to bring up the past. Coach no, Jones, you yeah. kept me whole last year, baby. You kept me whole. Well, mm-hmm. listen, I, I appreciate that. I appreciate the belief in our program. Uh, we're, I'm very fortunate to have coached here for this, my 26th season. Um, tremendous people. Um, and we've been able, I've been very fortunate that we've had the success that we've had. I got a great group of assistant coaches that have been with me for a long time. Matt Kingsley, uh, Justin Simon, Brandon Sherrod, Brandon and Justin both played for me and Caleb Cooper is my new director of basketball operations. So I have a great staff and I feel really good about them. They make my life easier in terms of what I need to do to be, help our team be successful. So I couldn't be happier. And, you know, and, and for me, the best part about coaching here is watching the young men that I've coached grow up. And every Christmas time I get uh, a holiday cards from them and their families and how they grow. And that's usually one of the best times of the season for me. Yeah. Sam, I'm going to make a prediction right here with Coach Jones, not because he's on here, but I'm going to say it. Yale. Gonna, 2024. I like that pick this year. I like 25. that pick. Oh, see, now, now he listens. Fine. You know how many years I've known this clown and he finally listened to me? <laughs> well, what, what was your? We're gonna go. We're, I'm gonna. I'm gonna pull up your entire record from last year out of all the conferences that you picked. Yeah, but, you know, yeah, what? Ivy like League was the one you got right to go to the tournament. So I'll give you well, that. It's like stock picks. You only talk about the ones you get right. You don't talk about all the duds. So I picked <laughs> this go. guy and the Bill Dogs. Hey, Coach, you're gonna stick on for one more second till we upload. But uh, you know, great episode. Thanks, Coach Jones, for joining us. Sam, thanks for being here. And uh, man, I'm excited for about the Ivy League. They had three teams go to postseason play last year two in the NIT and Coach Jones's Bulldogs in the NCAA and I think they're going to do it again and you know what I'd love to see 
is two teams in the NCAA tournament. So a man can dream. Christmas is happening December 25th at my house, and the big guy's <laughs> coming down the chimney, and it ain't me. So thanks for listening. Thanks for watching the Full Court Press podcast. Don't forget to subscribe, rate, and review. Be back next uh, next week, next day, with another conference preview or another great coach. Let's get it.